San Luis Valley is a special place, and, and for me, it's always been the most interesting part of Colorado. It's physically sort of magical. I think the San Luis Valley is one of the best kept secrets. They don't make this anymore. It's, it's so beautiful, it's so beautiful. It's a really remarkable place, but it's a place of contrasts and subtleties. You, do, you don't even know it at first. Maybe if we're lucky and visionary enough and work hard enough, we can at least do our part to see that this remains a great place. The San Luis Valley. In many ways, it's the quintessential Western landscape. Rugged mountains, expansive valleys, and the kind of wildlife that needs room to roam. The San Luis Valley lies in South Central Colorado, stretching from the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in the east to the San Juan Mountains in the west, all part of the Southern Rocky Mountains ecoregion. It ranks as one of the largest intermountain valleys in the world, with a total area roughly the size of Connecticut. The San Luis Valley has always been uh, at or near the top of our list. Uh, any analysis of Colorado would tell you the valley really contains some of the most unique uh, biological resources in Colorado. So we've always known it was a place we needed to be involved. It is a dry place, receiving only eight inches of rain per year. But what makes the valley unique is, in fact, its water. The valley floor features thousands of acres of desert. But underneath lies a vast ancient aquifer, fed and refilled by snow melt from the mountains. So amid the desert, we find wetlands, seasonal streams, and even permanent lakes. Including birds, mammals, and insects, more than 70 rare species have been identified here. The long, unbroken stretches of valley provide sufficient forage for herds of large mammals, like pronghorn and elk. My father tells a story about his mother standing in the kitchen of um, window and looking out the window and seeing from a distance the, uh, a, a long line of what she thought were, was a wagon train. And as it got closer, she realized it was actually bison. As the valley floor rises to greet the mountains, we also find one of the most unique sites on the American landscape, the Great Sand Dunes National Monument. These spectacular dunes are formed by a combination of natural forces, the waterways, the wind, the aquifer, and the mountains. As we began to continue to do our work planning, and particularly in eco-regional planning, we saw it in a much bigger context. And that's when you sort of see the whole system and that functioning. And in a sense, we're not after any one species in, or groups of species, or even communities of species in the San Luis Valley. We're after this system, this big biohydrological system um, that can only really be seen at that larger scale. The riches of the San Luis Valley have long provided sustenance to people as well. Signs of human habitation date back 11,000 years. Today, it rates as some of the most productive land in the West. Ranchers, potato farmers, barley growers, and other crop farmers of modern times have prospered here for generations. The Coleman family came to the valley in 1872. In addition to running Coleman Natural Beef, the late Mel Coleman served as a trustee of the Nature Conservancy. In a 1998 interview, he spoke of his concerns for the valley's long-term health. The water underneath the valley uh, supposedly is uh, in the amount of two billion acre feet. It's a vast amount of water. That's a gigantic reservoir that really ought to be preserved, kind of like a bank account. If you just take the interest off of it each year, or the water that is replaced each year in this reservoir, then it'll be there perpetually. And that's one thing that I think should never be tapped. But tapping that reservoir is exactly what some proposed. Export the valley's water to meet the needs of the explosive development happening along the front range of the Rockies and elsewhere in the West. If that were to happen on any significant scale, it would pull the foundation out from under the entire ecosystem throughout that entire valley. The people of the valley were uh, understandably appalled with the idea that this could occur. We knew instinctively that this water wasn't available. Amid these concerns, 
The Nature Conservancy bought the Medno Zapata Ranch in 1999, 150 square miles buffering the Great Sand Dunes National Monument. The acquisition of the Medno Zapata was in part um, a, a more typical traditional land acquisition, but really it was also a more strategic intervention. It was really a seat at the table. We put ourselves in the, the role of the landowner most likely to be affected if major water withdrawals occurred, which meant that we were buying a, a resource in the Medno Zapata that was, was still remained threatened even after our acquisition. And then we haven't been on this either. The Nature Conservancy's involvement in the valley began several years earlier and focused less on land acquisition than working with community leaders as they developed a vision for the valley's future. We were talking about compatible economic development for the valley. As a real poor community, there's always ways that we're looking to bring in new industry, something that's clean, something that's sustainable. We really signed on for an open-ended process with the community in searching for a long-term resolution that not only protected the conservation values, but really met the community's other economic and social and cultural objectives. The unifying issue for the community was water. But the depth of that unity was tested when a statewide ballot initiative came up that would have effectively cleared the way for water speculators. In response, the community did something quite extraordinary. They voted to tax themselves to fight the initiative. It was 94% in favor of doing this. Now, how many places do you know that would tax themselves to that extent to be able to fund the legal battle that we knew we had on our hands. There'd been a lot of water wars in the valley, but there's nothing quite like a common enemy to, to, to bring people together. And the, the cohesiveness of this valley in getting together and fighting these water export proposals was truly a defining moment in, in the valley's history. With a local consensus built and important statewide political battles won, perhaps the decisive move in this water war came in January 2002. The Nature Conservancy signed a purchase agreement for another strategically located 150 square mile property, the Baca Ranch. Its 97,000 acres represent not only the largest unfragmented landscape in the state of Colorado, but also a vital access point to the aquifer. The price tag, more than $31 million, required a unique consortium of private, state, and federal partners. With crucial backing from leaders across Colorado's political spectrum, it also brought the federal government's role to the fore, with plans ultimately leading to the creation of a new national park and wildlife refuge. It brought people from, from diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse regions of the valley, and certainly a lot of, of uh, state and federal agencies that maybe hadn't cooperated well in the past were, were convinced of their common interests. It was radical. More federal land, more park, and a federal water right to protect groundwater levels is a radical outcome that occurred uh, only because of this sort of integration of a whole lot of non-radical voices really finding that middle ground. By purchasing the Baca Ranch, the Nature Conservancy and its partners are linking together a mosaic of federal, state, and private lands, protecting more than 330,000 acres and an important portion of the valley's groundwater. The lands will be managed as one enormous natural area, ensuring that one of the world's last great places endures. <laughs>